Welcome to the last segment of Citizens Forum. Our guest in this segment is John Farquharson, and we're going to be talking about uh, local issues. We're going to start off with sewage treatment, which, which is a big issue because it's, we're talking about a billion dollars here to do something that, in my opinion, uh, shouldn't even be done because there's no, there seems to be no scientific benefit, no environmental benefit, according to the scientists, of um, building this $800 million sewage treatment plan. So, uh, John, you're a member of a group called STAG Sewage? Yeah, Sewage, sewage Treatment Action Group. Okay. And it's been around for uh, a number of years, but just recently, you know, we've got ourselves incorporated as a society. And uh, we're more or less launching STAG tomorrow around uh, what's called the Right Plan. So, Jack, you got a scoop here on your show, okay? So, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, big press conference down at the Oak Bay uh, Pavilion. Now, tomorrow meaning Thursday, know, October 24th. Right, okay. okay. There'll be history by the time this goes up. But, um, so there'll be a launch tomorrow of what we call the Right Plan. And it's an alternative to the, uh, the CRD's uh, sewage plan. And it's a plan that we feel is, um, has got uh, a, a great many benefits to what's being offered up by the by the CRD. And uh, at the launch, our special guest will be um, um, Oak Bay Gordon Head uh, MLA uh, Andrew Weaver. Green and Party MLA Green Andrew Party Weaver. Party MLA, and he's very much behind this particular uh, plan. And, and uh, I think what you're saying is, if we're being forced yeah. by the <coughs> CRD and whoever else to <coughs> build a sewage treatment plant, even though we don't need one, then let's at least build the best thing we can possibly build at the best price. Yeah, let's get, um, it, it has to do with what's called an evolution in thinking. And it, it applies to me and it applies to a lot of the people I'm associated with in STAG. And we tend to be very science-based people. And when all the marine scientists up at UVic and the public health officers say the current secondary marine treatment uh, process is, uh, is fine. So you mean what's happening right now? We, we currently have a marine-based secondary treatment. Okay, Which that means we pump it into the ocean, and the ocean in our case just happens to do a great job. We're very lucky that way. Okay, so um, my thinking has evolved, saying that, okay, if, you're, if the governments, the provincial government and the federal government is going to come along and say, we don't care about your unique situation, you need to do land-based uh, secondary treatment. Okay, uh, then if we're going to do land-based secondary treatment, let's do the best land-based secondary treatment that we can do, you know, for taxpayers' dollar. And that's what the right plan is all about. And right, R-I-T-E, stands for it being responsible, innovative, taxpayer friendly, and envir very environmentally progressive. And uh, by the first one, with respect to responsible, the, uh, there was an attempt to force a large industrial operation into the Viewfield community, and this was going to be the sludge plant, right? right. Viewfield said, no, that sort of, you know, um, primary industrial uh, operation doesn't belong in this kind of in a community like this and same thing with McLaughlin Point right now the you know again the Esquimalt uh, council has said no to it large industrial operation there is an alternative and it's it's a distributed tertiary system and uh, you know the, the world-class trendsetter example is right available in our own backyard at uh, Dockside Green so rather than having two large industrial operations forced into uh, communities that don't want them, uh, the proposal is to have um, 16 dockside-like facilities spread throughout the community. And uh, I'm not sure if you've ever been down to Dockside Green. I have, and there's a, it's, it's quite beautiful. People, you know, they eat their croissants and sip cappuccino right above the, uh, the tertiary treatment. Yeah, so just again, let's say that again. There's a little cafe there, right, right yeah. next to this this right tertiary on top of, on top sewage of it. treatment plant on top of it, yeah. and as you say, people <laughs> sip their coffees and eat their croissants right next to it. So, in other words, tertiary treatment, which is much higher level of treatment, a much better treatment than the secondary treatment that the CRD is now planning to give us, <coughs> can be very attractive, small scale, not intrusive. It's a small scale. In terms of intrusiveness, think Dockside Green, or I think there's a, there's a pump station right down in the heart of Oak Bay, right next to Windsor Park. It's on Curry Road. And it looks kind of like a house. It doesn't have any windows. But, you know, you'd be hard-pressed to say that that's a pump station. Fits right in. 
So it's facilities like that that would be distributed around the Capital Regional District to treat sewage to the, you know, as far as I know, the highest possible standard right now, which is tertiary. And the, uh, the effluent coming out is, as they say, near potable water. Near potable water can be used to flush toilets and for irrigation purposes. So it's quite an advantage. So it does a better job of cleaning up the water? Well, I mean, you think about the water thing. I mean, the, the uh, CRD secondary treatment is going to put um, uh, 50 to 90 percent of the toxins that currently are in our, uh, these are the nasties that people talk about, chemicals of emerging concern. Uh, they're going to go back into the marine environment with the proposed CRD. This would take all of those out of the effluent. So as I say, you'd have near potable water. So again, it goes back to being um, environmentally extremely progressive. And um, they've been planning the CRD secondary treatment now for like over seven years. And a lot has changed with, uh, with sewage treatment technology. So what might have been um, seen as too expensive seven years ago is no longer, that, that may no longer be the case. I say may because this, the uh, CRD has never fully costed a distributed tertiary system. They've put out a, uh, a, um, a discussion paper that said it would cost too much. And they've made estimates, as I discussed last time, that uh, say it would cost two billion. Okay, so the CRD is saying that a tertiary treatment system, which is much better than what they're planning, mm -hmm. and can get rid of a lot of the problems of sight, smell, and noise, really, it's much, much, much better. The CRD was told that that kind of a, of a system would cost two billion dollars. That's what the and directors were told. And they were told this by Jack Hull, who, who what's Jack Hull's position? He's currently the pro, well, he's, um, there's a new project director. Uh, okay, but Albert's he was. He, up until like this month or last month, he was the official so project Jack director. So Jack Hull was He's the in project transition. director. Right. And mm -hmm. he informed the CRD board, am I correct, uh -huh. that this kind of a plan that you're talking about would be $2 billion. But someone looked into it. Yep. Um, well, Richard, Richard Atwell, Richard Atwell, Atwell. Bad plan, right? And he found out that really the cost would be one billion dollars. It could be a bill. It could be a billion. It could be less than a billion. It could be, <coughs> pardon me. It could be less than the eight hundred and seventy million that's currently uh, on the books for this. So plan. It, what's been amazing to me is this story sort of came out a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. the city's media, for some strange reason, has kept <coughs> has me. kept <laughs> this story. They they simply haven't told people that the CRD board was given by the project director a figure of two billion dollars to build this system when in fact it now seems possible that the correct figure may be one billion or less or less now isn't that an important story and yet the public is never told and you gotta start to ask yourself what is wrong with the people who we have elected onto the CRD why do they keep pushing this project forward and what's wrong with the city's media? Yeah, I don't know why they. I don't know why they keep pushing it forward. I mean, it's it's um, it's uh, it's a question I've you know wrestled with, and 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 all I can come up with is they uh, just want it out of their way. They're committed to it. They've bought into it, and uh, they're going to go with it. And when you bring in new information, alternatives, they're just, you know, it's like my mind's, it's sort of that classic, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Uh, I mean, it's just, I, it's, it's inexplicable to me, I just, I don't get it at all. Now, the chairwoman up till this point of the Sewage Treatment Committee, the committee of the CRD that's been leaving, has been Denise Blackwell mm -hmm. of Langford? Langford, she's a Langford counselor. Okay. On the board also have been, I think, four people from Victoria. Yeah. Now ask me to name them. Well, Dean, Dean, Fortin, Dean Fortin, Marian Alto, Jeff Young. Marian Alto, Jeff Young, ben and Ben Isitt. And from Saanich, it's been Mayor Frank Leonard, and I don't know I don't who know else. The other ones. Yeah. But anyways, oh, this Vic Derman. Vic Derman, and, and he's been the one person. Vic Derman has been the one person that has been progressive, and I think correct on this issue basically from day one. I'd like to know why Victoria City Council, I live in Victoria, I'd like to know why Victoria City Council seems to vote as a block to push this stupid, expensive, unnecessary 
project ahead when the people of Victoria, I don't think, are 100% behind it. And yet well, our, our councillors vote 100% for it. Let's say it's even a 50-50 split. Who are, they, who are they representing when they continue to push this project ahead? Well, I mean, where the, where the, uh, you know, the good uh, taxpayers are at is, is a question that's uh, up in the air right now. And so part of the launch tomorrow of the right plan will be a petition. And it'll be a petition to decision makers uh, around who can make decisions about the sewage project and those who can in, <coughs> pardon me, influence these decision makers. And the ask in the petition will be to forget the current plan, adopt the right plan. That's the ask. And it'll be an online petition and we're certainly hoping to get uh, tens of thousands of signatures and uh, basically uh, give people as much information through I'll plug it here. It's the it's the rightplan.ca. You can go on there, find out a lot about the the two competing plans, the CRD plan and the the right plan. The right plan is spelled R I T E. R I T E, and you can uh, make up your own mind. And if you feel that the right plan is uh, is a better one, then certainly sign the petition. But has as far as you know, has the CRD or any of the municipalities done some polling? to find out what the public actually wants. You know what, CFAX did something. It, it was a, cu a, a couple of months ago, I think, right after a major decision had been made by the CRD to push this ahead, uh, CFAX just did uh, you know, their usual poll of the day. Yeah. And, and the question was, now that they're moving ahead, do you think this is a good thing? And it was like, I think it was 85% were saying no. I mean, 85% were saying no. Clearly there are some real problems here. And yet, our elected representatives keep moving this billion dollar plan ahead. Why? It's very frustrating and, and CFAX can do a poll. The reason we're doing this particular petition is that it's, you know, it's, it's an official petition, okay, in the sense that, um, as I understand it, members of the Legislative Assembly are basically obligated once their once constituents have signed uh, a petition they're obligated to bring it into the legislature right so when the legislature when the legislature sits again in february uh this petition will be will be brought forward and what will be interesting then jack is that um it's aimed at decision makers and uh, those people who can influence decision makers and in february will be you know 10 months out from a municipal election so in terms of how to change people's minds I mean, you can't change them with the science, obviously. You can't change them with a CFAX poll. But possibly when you begin to threaten their uh, re-election, then maybe they'll sit up and take notice. If yeah. one, one would hope so. One would hope so. Yeah. Okay, so the right plan, I mean, to me, that's, that's the way to go. You want it, is there anything more on this, or should we move to the next, uh, next topic? Um, no, that's, uh, that's good. Okay. And I just want to mention one more time that it seems the CRD board was given incorrect information by the project director, Jack Hull, who informed them that uh, a tertiary system would cost $2 billion when in fact it's possible it can be done for under $1 billion, which brings it into line and it's a much better system, pricing the same as, as what the CRD is planning to do. You wanted to talk about the crystal pool and the infrastructure deficit in Victoria. Yeah, I just started that last time I was on, didn't get a chance to finish, but uh, basically the crystal pools in dire straits, as you may know. It's the main recreation center in the city of Victoria. Right, and um, something has to be done about it. And so the original proposal was to go ahead and um, engage the public. Uh, I chuckle here, right, because these engagement processes are just uh, real head shakers in terms of uh, what you get with regard to information. So with this one, it was proposed that they go forward and engage the public on what the public, gain public input on what to do with the crystal pool. Trick was, they weren't going to uh, provide the report on the infrastructure deficit. This report has been forthcoming for like two years, okay? So a group called Open Victoria, community group, said, hey, this just is not on. How can you make a decision on the crystal pool without putting it in the larger context of our overall infrastructure deficit? Um, and so they pushed for that. And um, finally, you know, council relented and said, okay, we will release the infrastructure report. 
and uh, the engagement process for the crystal pool will be done within that context. But what was interesting was to hear the different counselors in terms of, uh, of, um, of you know, having this report put out. For example, uh, Councillor Helps says, uh, I think... Councillor... <coughs> Lisa Helps. Lisa Helps, okay. She says, I think the request to put the report out there is great. In fact, it would have been good to have it before we made a decision on the Johnson Street Bridge. So that's Councillor Helps saying, great idea, let's go for it. Get that report out there. How can you make a decision on one infrastructure uh, um, issue independent of the larger infrastructure deficit uh, overall? Uh, compare that to, uh, you know, Councillor Alto. She says, I don't think what they are asking is unreasonable. So it's hardly a ringing endorsement of saying that decisions should be made within the broader context of the overall infrastructure deficit. So I was struck by that. So anyways, we get the report, push for the report, report's going to come out. But what the city did, what the city has done since then, is they have uh, limited the options to a publicly owned, publicly run uh, facility. So any notions of a 3P or any, anything else other than a publicly run, publicly owned, publicly run by QP facility is off the table. So, you know, that's kind of disappointing because I would have liked to have, you know, had my two cents worth in there in terms of, uh, of can, first of all, can we afford a publicly uh, owned and publicly run public uh, swimming pool? Can we afford it? I mean, that question was never asked when we went to build a, an iconic, you know, new bridge. The question was never asked, can we afford it within the, within the larger context of our overall infrastructure deficit? So right away, they're saying um, other options are off the table. But, I mean, to me, the crystal pool is so desperately needed. I mean, how can you not afford it? How can you not have it? Well, that's a good question. I would like to have that exchange within the context of knowing uh, what the overall infrastructure deficit is and what are the trade-offs. For example, if, I, if somebody says to me, well, we can, afford, we can either afford to put bike lanes, the, the, the Bay Street Bridge also needs uh, some fine-tuning. They've just spent $100 million on the Blue Bridge, which was totally unnecessary. Oh. I mean, it, it, well, that goes back to affordability. So they do these one-offs, one-off, 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 without ever asking the fundamental question, Given our overall infrastructure deficit, can we afford this particular item? To go back to the, you know, the publicly owned, publicly run uh, pool, if somebody came along and said, well, we can, have either a, we can either have that or we can have extended bike lanes on the Bay Street Bridge, that would be an interesting discussion to have. Or we can ask, or we can have $3 billion of profit by the Royal Bank in the last three months. I mean, that's where the money's really going. I think we're out of time, John. Out of time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks You're for watching pleasure. Citizens Forum.